This is Playing Policy Blues by Blind Arthur Blake. <laughs> blues and I want to comment on the line where he says I beg my baby let me in her door I want to put my 25 55 75 in her 7 17 24 and that shows that Blake is a real numerologist because I think if you write down these numbers with a little flair 25 55 75 and 7 17 you will see that they are the sexiest numbers in the world. Hi, I'm Terry Allen and I'm talking about guitar tunings and tonality. And What I want to do is go back to the time when John Lennon was learning to play guitar from his mother. He learned to play in open t G tuning and experimented with a number of variants which involved primarily lowering the bass string from D to C lowering the fifth string from B to B flat to make a G minor tuning and lowering the top string or rather raising the top string to E which is what I have here and in the blind Blake, Blake terminology he would call this sweet papa because it has the D G D G configuration in the bass and on top it has an E note instead of a D, which you usually find in open G. So that makes the chord a G6. And it gives a more uh, major tonality than open G. And it has some features which Blind Blake apparently liked, which is that the um, turnaround is uh, located with the tonic note underneath the seventh instead of underneath the tonic on the bass string and that allows him to play this figure
which is harder to do in open G. And this tuning also has the advantage that the long A form allows the guitars to reach up to the A on the top string. Whereas in open G has to stretch this far. So that makes um, Blake songs in which he has the long A with the A on top and not using capo, because sometimes he does capo, then that shows that he's in the G6 tuning, which we call drop G, because it's a continuation of the drop D uh, idea. So if you're in standard tuning, you lower the bass string to D, that's drop D, and then if you lower the A string to G, that makes drop G tuning. You have the top four strings remain in the standard tuning configuration, but the bottom two strings are in the open G configuration. And that apparently is Blake's favorite tuning, but he also knows open D and open G very well, so it's interesting to try and figure out which songs he's playing in open G, which I think would be a song like Diddy Wah Diddy, where you don't have this turnaround. But you never hear Robert Johnson play. He only plays the turnaround with the descending bass line. And you don't hear Johnson using the uh, ascending line. features of tunings is the concept of favored keys, which means in every tuning some keys are favored, more playable, more expressive than other keys, and the keys can be ranked in order of their playability. And in this way the key is actually inside of the tuning the same way a chord is inside of a key. And I'm going to try to illustrate this in a simple way using a single string, which is called a diddly string. And a diddly bob is a scientific word for something that you move back and forth rapidly with your finger. And a diddly string is a primitive way to study a vibrating string by stretching a wire or a cat gut uh, across a piece of wood and uh, having a primitive device to tune the string. Tuning or intonation is the act of establishing the correct pitch for a string according to a tuning rule by varying the mass of the string, the length, and the tension. The mass we usually know as the string gauge was also affected by the composition of the string and whether it's wound and what kind of material the string is made of. The length we can vary with the capo which changes the length of a string and um, we can adjust the tuning with the tuning peg. So you notice that the note to which a string is tuned can vary in three ways according to the mass, the length, or the tension on the string. So I want to try and describe tonality on a single string because it's fairly easy to understand and then when we put the strings together to make a guitar tuning we're not so easily confused. And this goes back to a dude named Pythagoras who was really the first guitarist in a way. He didn't play guitar, he didn't even play lute, but he studied vibrating strings and he gave us the rule for making guitar frets. Now Pythagoras was known as Mr. Triangle. He gave us the Pythagorean theorem for the distance around the sides of a triangle. And he was very interested in numbers. He loved whole numbers. 
and he was disturbed by triangles that had irrational numbers, crazy numbers that could come so easily. For example, if you had a triangle that had sides of one and one, the hypotenuse would be a length of a square root of two. And that is not a rational number. You can't write it as a fraction. And so Pythagoras was very interested one day when he discovered the golden ratios that are inherent in the vibrating string. Now what golden ratios are is me it means that the notes that a vibrating string make are related by whole numbers. So we have the harmonic and it's located in the middle of the string and it divides the string by two. And then there's another harmonic here that's located at one-third the length of the string. So the string is divided by three. And then another one where the string is divided by four. And then they get sort of hard to hear after that. But what Pythagoras noted is that all of the notes that occur on the string are multiples of the basic note to which the tune is string, string is tuned called the fundamental. The fundamental is the lowest note on the string and there is no low note lower than the lowest note. And every note on the string is formed by adding to the lowest note. So the lowest note is like a prime number. You can only know it from the tuning and once you know the note of the string tuning, you know every note and position on the string simply by adding to that tuning note. Now, an interesting kind of triangle is created there because we have three sets of values. The first one is the fret value, and that's easy to count. We go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 frets. And then we have the pitch values, and that's what you hear when I play the string at that fret. So we have the pitch value 0, that's the fundamental note. And then we have pitch value 1 at fret 1, pitch value 2 at fret 2, and so on. And we just count up and form all of the pitch values by adding to the lowest note on the string. And then there's the third, third set of values. Now when I say values, it simply means something that you can count with whole numbers. And that includes the notes C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F, F sharp, G, and so on. But it also includes positions like fret or string positions that you count with whole numbers. And it also includes the scale position. Now the scale position is not defined unless we know the key. So for example, this note could be any scale position but we know that if the key is the same note as the scale position, then that's the first degree. And we can count up and form the other scale degrees from that central note, which is the tonal center of the key. So now I have two centers here. I have, first of all, the fundamental note that the string is tuned to and I have a key center. And in music theory, we're taught that those are independent, that the fundamental and the key could assume any value, and they wouldn't be, have to be related. So the key can be any note on the string, and the fundamental can be tuned to any note. And so we have the idea that music could have 
two equal centers. Now, the way that playability arises is, is pretty obvious here. And I'm going to play a simple bass line on the uh, bass string to illustrate this, which goes like this. this is called going home. <laughs> So that's a, a pentatonic scale, and it's based on this idea that you keep lifting up to the fundamental note. And so that open string note is the tonic of the first chord, and then it becomes the dominant note of the next chord. the five chord so that's a blues figure a harmonic figure that is projected onto the guitar and if I play that in a different key it will still sound in tune because the frets are tempered and that makes the distance between every note in terms of pitch equal and lets me play in any key without sounding out of tune because if the frets weren't tempered then the favorite key would be very obvious it would be the same key as the string is tuned to and you could maybe play off of one or two other keys and not sound too badly out of tune but all the other keys would sound out of tune and you wouldn't want to use them. The, the key of the string would actually sound better if it was untempered, but the other keys would sound worse. Now, when this, even though the, the frets are tempered, it doesn't make the musical figure easy to play in every key. Now, we have here sort of the idea of a closed space. Every musical system is closed, and the notes cannot move, move out of the system because if they go beyond the limits, they return in an octave lower or higher. So if I have, for example, in this tuning, a note that moves off the lowest string, then it returns here and begins to so this is a closed system and any musical figure can be projected on the first string but it takes a different pattern according to what key it's in. So if I try and play this figure in any key other than the key that's the same as the fundamental, I run into a problem with this lift up note. So then I get in a situation where I have to use two fingers to play it. Obviously that's much more difficult, although in some positions you find that there is some advantage. You get other lift up notes that you might use, but you find that that lick, the going home bass line, it really has only one home. Only one key that it can be played correctly in. And the worst key is the one that's located one fret lower than the fundamental that starts up here. That really makes my life difficult. And so, 
the keys, the favored keys on that string are rankable. And that's a property of any musical system is that the musical objects in it can be ranked in order from first to last and everything falls in place in between. Now, peculiar problem when you have only one string is that you cannot play any musical intervals because it's impossible to play more than one note on a string at a time. And that problem goes away when we add the other strings on the guitar because they give us another place to play the note. And so most of that problem goes away, but there remains a problem of forbidden note intervals on the first string. And those are the notes that are located on the first string up to where the first string equals the second string. So that's five notes, one, two, three, four, five. And they cannot be played with each other. I can't play these two notes together because they fall on the same string. So that leaves a set of notes at the bottom end of the guitar that cannot be played together. And you have another set of notes up here on the top string, the top five notes in standard tuning that have the same problem, but it's less significant because you don't usually play those notes uh, together in intervals. Now, the, the notes on the, on the single string are different in their playability. The open string note that is like the primary note requires no fingers to play and therefore it has a playability of zero. You can play it without any fretting hand fingers. And all of the other notes on the string require one finger and therefore they have a playability of one. Zero, playability, one. Now, playability concerns rules of how musical tones please the fingers. And that is no different of a tonal consideration than whether musical tones please our ears. Because what pleases our ears and what pleases our fingers is not something that we can derive scientifically, it's just something we observe. In open G you have a series of diatonic chords that go like this. Or probably most guitarists would look at it like this. That's probably what John Lennon used for the song Here, uh, There, and Everywhere. And everywhere. And the playability of these chords is a little bit shifted towards the major form because it takes me three fingers to play the minor chord. This would be like A, A minor. And C, D, E minor, and a diminished chord. And so that makes that series a little bit harder than if I go to G minor. G minor, you have a set of diatonic chords where you have the major chord played with a bar and one finger, C, and the minor chord played with one finger, C minor. So this is a tuning that probably was attractive to Django Reinhardt, who 
injured his hand in a fire. And Django Reinhardt was a spectacular musical genius. And he had uh, started performing at the age of 12, around in the early 20s, before records were commonly available. And so the idea that his style was influenced by black American musicians is just preposterous. And the remarkable thing about Django's miraculous recovery was that he began to perform about nine months after he burned his hand, which is just enough time for his hand to, to heal well enough where he could play without having a lot of pain. And so that tells us that Django did not have to relearn to play guitar. That he, that he had to modify his style for his disabled hand, but he was using tunings that he already knew and did not have to relearn because it would have taken him several years if he had to relearn a tuning. And this tuning, the G minor, is uh, particularly uh, attractive because it allows him to play in almost any key. And that's a hallmark of his uh, guitar music, is he doesn't seem to have a favorite key, unless you look really closely and then you realize some of the songs he's moved away from the key of the sheet music to a more favorable guitar key. But he's clearly very versatile. And one way you get that versatility is from this tuning. Now, I want to show uh, the Louie Louie progression which I think is frustrating to uh, musical teachers. And the thing is, people who teach musical theory, for the most part, they don't know diddly because they don't study the vibrating string. They come from the keyboard and the musical staff, and they don't understand how the guitar works. And the Louis Louis progression is particularly frustrating because they can't really explain why the minor chord is there and why it's so surprising. So you have this kind of thing. This would be G, C, D minor. And you, that minor is an endlessly surprising thing there because it sounds like you're, you sort of expect it to be D major and it's D minor. So. take that musical figure and move it around to different keys and see what kind of effect you get. And one thing that um, can be used to make that a little more interesting is just move it up to one, one fret higher. me the ability to mute this, this whereas here I'm sort of the, have the ringing out strings whereas this one I can mute it sort of make it match the other chord tonality now if I move it up two more frets so now I'm in B flat then I get uh, the lie of the figure on the guitar is a little bit more evenly spaced out and it also gives me a chance to fall back to the minor sixth chord. If I move the, if I move the position up to C, then I have the, uh, I have C here, F, and G minor. Tuning is a kind of an entree into the one six four five progression that was uh, widespread throughout Europe and not very much used in blues guitar at all until it appeared in rock and roll in the 50s. And you have this progression here where you have the one 
chord, this is C, falling back to this minor chord, the sixth minor, which is A minor. And then instead of going to F, it goes to D minor. And then the G7. And it has a nicer quality than using the F chord. So it's C, A minor, D minor, D7. And that kind of chord progression is widespread throughout Django Reinhardt's um, music. And it has a peculiar uh, aspect in it harmonically because this kind of progression It violates a rule in four-part harmony that says that chords are not supposed to have parallel motion. So if you submit this progression to your music teacher in four-part harmony, it will say that's no good because you have parallel motion. This chord is the same form, and then that just moves it up too. But on guitar, that kind of movement sounds really good. And so that's kind of a puzzle why that, why when we move guitar chords up and down the neck and we don't change the voicing, they sound really good. Chasing Shadows by Django Reinhardt. of open G minor is very different than the tonality of open G. And that has to do with the different voicing of the strings. And um, that's difficult to understand because all of the guitar tunings have the same notes. Now, I want to return to the triangle, the musical triangle, and um, talk about the shape of the triangle because Pythagoras was, um, he was the first one to start the secret musical club of musicians who understand that the key is inside of the tuning. And so the key of G in this tuning is defined by the tuning and in the same way that a chord is defined by the key. So I have, for example, this chord is C. The chord by itself is undefined because we don't know if it's the one chord, the five chord, the three chord, or whatever chord it is until somebody tells us it's the key of C. And then we know that this chord is the one chord in the key of C. And the same thing happens with the tuning in that the key of C by itself on the guitar is not defined. Is it the key of C in open G tuning or the key of C in standard tuning? Because those are different musical sets. And so the key of C is defined in this case by the open G tuning. And why this is important is um, seen by Blind Blake's uh, rest stroke of the thumb pick, which is a characteristic sound. It's called double thumbing, in which he has uh, the rest note starts like this. Consists of uh, first an eighth note and then a quarter note. Or you can look at the eighth note as being a dotted eighth, or also a grace note that is just stealing time from the bass note. And in Blake's technique, the ba is always on the off beat, and the dumb is always falling on the beat, and usually on the first beat of the chord. 
and you hear this kind of a sound in um, in the uh, Loving Spoonful's Daydream. finger-style guitars such as Gary Davis and Merle Travis, they have an elaborate system of chords which are designed to accommodate the arpeggiation of the bass, or a so-called alternating bass, because you want, in the Travis style, you usually want the bass notes on the sixth and fourth strings so you can go and in the Blake style you want this and so you have to have your chords with the bass notes in the proper place you can't have a missing bass note and so in open G the key of C is very very strong for that kind of bass arpeggiation and you can't you run into problems in standard tuning that you cannot explain or understand unless you know open G and the the main problems that you have going from standard tuning that you know how to play a song in key of G standard tuning the main problem that you have getting to open G and it's a big problem is following the path of the tonal movement because in open G we have this kind of tuning rule five, seven, five, four, three. So we have the seven here is kind of like a gap and the three here is like a contraction and it's hard to follow the path of tonal movement in across those sort of anomalous tuning structures and so the problem that you have is that the D chord in open G is very difficult to play and presents a number of problems and the E chord is fingered in a different way it's so different from standard tuning it's difficult to wrap your mind around this E chord um, is not difficult to play in open G but it's fingered in a very unusual way and it operates very different so those are two of the main problems that you encounter in trying to get to open G is just played in a very different way than standard tuning and the relation between tunings is more complicated than you think for example Drop D tuning seems to be just a derivative of standard tuning in which you simply add two frets to every note on the bass string and that would form the drop D tuning. And that actually is, uh, well it's, it works as a memory aid but it doesn't really help you understand drop D tuning very well. And the first musical triangle that I discovered was uh, involved drop D tuning because I realized there are two ways to go to drop D tuning. So if I have the key of E in standard, I would play my E chord like this. And then I could change that into drop D by adding two notes to the bass string. So I would finger my E chord like this. Now I've got two strings under one finger. Or I would reach up with my thumb and get that. E note at the second fret. But another way to do it is to lower the five other strings. That is, instead of raising the bass string two notes, I lower the five strings by two notes, and that takes me to drop D, but now I'm in the key of D. 
So that makes a triangle. I have standard tuning key of E, and I have drop D key of D, and drop D key of E. And from that triangle, I learned an interesting fact, which is that all guitar tunings are separated by one operation. So it doesn't matter how many strings are different, how different the tonality of the tunings may be, or whether it's a good tuning to play in or not, you go there in one operation consisting of two steps. And the two steps are important because the first step is an algebraic step. That means you just have a rule and you move the notes between tunings according to a rule that says add two frets to this string. The problem with the algebraic rule is it may not be playable. And what good are harmonic notes if they're not playable on the guitar? The most beautiful notes in the world are, are no use to a guitarist unless he can play them in an expressive and easy way. So, when we go from one tuning to another, notes move, but they do not change their sound and therefore we can't hear the movement when we go from standard tuning to drop D, the G moves from the third fret to the fifth fret and we cannot hear that tuning change but it, it greatly affects the way the guitar sounds and the way that it's played. Now on the single string we can think of the string as being a line in which the notes are embedded. But we can also think of the, in, the string and every possible sound that the string can be produced as being the same as the note to which the string is tuned. Now the note that it's tuned to is not a pitch. So for example, this string is tuned to D and D is the fundamental tone of that string because it is the D note married to the open position. It is a pitch and a position combined and the fundamental is not the same as the pitch because the same pitch occurs here but this note is a fundamental and this note is a secondary note that is formed from this fundamental by adding three. So these notes have the same pitch value, but they are not the same tonal value. Now, so that means we can think of the string as being a line or a point or a triangle. And the triangle again is formed, it has one side that's the fret numbers, 1 through 12, and one side that is the pitch values, 1 through 12, and then the third side that is the scale value, and that is determined by the key center And all of those three values must share the same center of the triangle. Now, we're taught in music theory that, that notes can move in two directions and it's usually explained as being one direction is a chromatic direction. Chroma is a reference to spectrums of color, and the idea of chromatic is you go through every note in order by adding one to the note before it. So if I add one to this note, I have this note, and then I keep adding one, and eventually I form all of the notes on the string. 
that's called the chromatic scale or chromatic function and then I have another function which is I can go by intervals that may be one or may be any value and these are the harmonic functions and the reason they're harmonic is because they are the golden ratios that Pythagoras taught us they are multiples of the fundamental frequency or they are formed by addition and so this is a peculiar system in which multiplication and addition are the same and since we don't like multiplication we rather have addition we can think of notes as formed only by addition that's the only operation we have on this string is that we add notes one at a time or in intervals now this is the funny part about the geometry that Pythagoras taught us and that is that the distance between any harmonic intervals is always one that's confusing because you know I think that these notes are separated by three steps and therefore their interval apart is three steps and music is the house of sticks that is built of 12 intervals that are combined to make any possible interval that can occur so it makes me confused to think about the idea that this E note and this G note are actually one step apart and that comes from the circular nature of music because the octave is closed so we have this kind of pitch class phenomenon where we count up to 12 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 and then 13 is the same as 1 we start counting over again and the 13th note is the same pitch class as the first note so we have this funny kind of arithmetic on the clock where 12 plus 1 equals 1 and that is a, a kind of a funny world to live in because it's circular and it's circular in several different ways so the key on this string so I have here this is the D string and if this is the G note and I make that the key the center of gravity about which tonal movement occurs it might seem to you that that is independent of the note that the strings tune to this is the key of G this is the key of G in an abstract sense that any instrument can play the key of G but in fact this G is defined by the fundamental of this string that says that the G will be on the fifth fret and so the key is not independent of the fundamental and we have this phenomenon of the favored keys now on the guitar a note can move in three directions and let's count them here first of all we can see that the note can go up or down the string and it does so in such a way that whenever the fret number rises the pitch value rises and whenever the fret number goes down the pitch value goes down and then the other obvious direction is perpendicular to that 
and runs across the strings so that we have again this rule that when the string number increases the pitch increases and when the string number goes down the pitch goes down so that establishes two clearly different directions that notes can travel up and down the strings and across the strings now there's a third direction here <laughs> I've got five notes here that are the same pitch value D and they're on five different strings. So I have here a third direction of travel and it's characterized by the fact that the string number can go down or up and the pitch doesn't change. String one, same pitch, string two, same pitch, string three. And it looks like the path of tonal movement is diagonal across the neck at maybe like a 45 degree angle. So let's look at, here's one of these musical triangles and what I say to you is you can think of any musical triangle you want to and you'll always come up with the same figure with an equilateral right triangle. So if I start here and I go up to here that's one side of the triangle that's one octave long and then I go back here and I go to the from the first to the fourth string that's one octave long too so from here to here that's one octave and then I move in this diagonal path and it only crosses one note that's the only note and again that's one octave long crosses 12 frets. So I have this triangle, one octave, one octave, one octave. So it's the same length on each of three sides. It's an equilateral triangle. And it's pretty easy to see the angle between the frets and the strings is 90 degrees. So there's a rule if the sides of the triangle are equal, the angles must be equal too. So this triangle here, there's three equal sides and three angles equal to 90 degrees. That is the golden triangle that Pythagoras was talking about. And he called this the harmony of spheres because this triangle occurs in a natural way on the surface of the earth in the same way it occurs naturally on the guitar and you cannot help but follow the lines of this triangle because that is the physical reality so if I tell you draw a triangle on the surface of the earth and I say start wherever you are head in any direction you want and travel one quarter of a way around the earth mark the corner of the triangle there and turn 90 degrees to the right travel one quarter of a way around the world mark another corner of the triangle and then travel one quarter of a way around the world and you come back to the point where you started on the surface of the sphere you automatically make this golden triangle which has three sides and three 90 degree angles and you you would follow that that triangle no matter what as long as you're on the surface of the earth and so what happens is musicians like Jimi Hendrix and John Lennon are following the musical triangles that are constructed on the guitar and they follow this funny kind of mathematics automatically without even thinking about it 
and they have a system of playability logic which they use with the harmony that they can hear. And the playability and the harmony fit together like a crossword puzzle in which the harmony and the playability are perpendicular. Now, perpendicular in, in music, we, we can look at this in three, three different ways. Because any two objects that you can think of in music are perpendicular to each other. And that can mean that there's a 90 degree angle that you can measure as a right angle. That's one definition. Another definition is that the variables are independent and they can change either one or the other or both. Now, this is a confusing idea for people who learn music theory on the piano or the musical staff. They think that the pitch is always the same as the position. Okay? Middle C always occurs on the same piano key. It is never found anywhere else. And this artifact is created by fixing concert pitch. If we let concert pitch move, then the C could be at another position. And the three-way movement of notes is not clear on the piano because the piano notes can go up and down the keyboard and they can change their scale position according to the key. But what would be the third direction that tonal movement could occur on the piano? Well, that's the transposing piano. Now, Irving Berlin liked to play piano in the key of F. There was something about the position of the black keys that made the key of F particularly playable to him, particularly expressive, and he really didn't want to play in any other key, but he needed to be able to sing in other keys to compose, so he invented the transposing piano. And the transposing piano has a lever, which you move, and it shifts the keyboard over relative to the set of strings. So in this way we see on the piano that we thought have had 12 major keys actually has 144 major keys in terms of the instrument position and the scale position and the keyboard position. And so this goes back to a comment that uh, Gary Davis made when he said they could play Candyman in 18 different ways. And since there are only 12 major keys, how could he come up with 18 different ways to play Candyman? And I think the answer was he had several different tunings and he had two or three keys per tuning and pretty soon you can come up with any number of major keys that you want to and each of these keys is a unique structure. The key of G in open G is not the key of G in open D. Blind Arthur's Breakdown. <laughs>